Hello and welcome to India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The top stories that we're tracking for you this evening. The Sensex and the Nifty hit another record high as bulls maintain the momentum on the Lal Street. The mid-cap index scales a new peak for the 11th day running. The market cap of shares listed on the BSC crosses 400 lakh crore rupees for the first time. Wipro shares wobble after the surprise resignation of CEO Thierry Delaporte. Srinivas Palia, who's been with Wipro for over three decades to take over as the new CEO, Wipro's revenue growth has contracted in each of the last four quarters. After stepping down as the CEO of Bandhan Bank, Chandrasekhar Ghosh says the decision was totally voluntary and personal. Adds the bank is looking for an external CEO and if they don't find one in three months, they could appoint an internal candidate. Shares of Bandhan Bank down 6% today. GST authorities claim alleged tax evasion in FI24 nearly doubled to over 2 lakh crore rupees. Sources say online gaming and the casino industry, which is fighting the tax authorities in court, allegedly evaded taxes worth over 83,500 crore rupees last fiscal. That's an exclusive. With nearly 4 million cars sold in FI24, passenger vehicle sales in India hit a record high. For the first time, SUVs account for 50% of overall car sales as per the Federation of Automobile Dealers. The union government considers policy support for locally made semiconductor chips, but sources say there will be no restrictions on imported chips to meet domestic demand. That's another exclusive tonight. There should not be a contest between states and the central government, says the Supreme Court, as it hears a petition from the Karnataka government seeking drought relief. The apex court stopped short of issuing a notice to the centre, asking both parties to find an amicable solution. U.S. Secretary of State Janet Yellen delivers a sharp message to China, says future discussions between both nations will focus on Beijing's need to shift its policy on industry and the economy. Yellen discussed market-based reforms and concerns over overcapacity in her talks with Chinese authorities. Israel pulls out most of its troops from southern Gaza, but the defense minister says the withdrawal is aimed at preparing for future operations. Conflicting reports from the ceasefire talks underway in Cairo as Hamas officials deny claims of any progress. Blame game starts between Russia and Ukraine after one of the six reactors at Europe's largest nuclear power plant is attacked. The International Atomic Energy Agency condemns the attacks, warns of a major nuclear accident. Non-communicable diseases are rising in India. Cancer is the chief concern, says Apollo's Health of the Nation report. Also finds a rise in mental health disorders with 20% of people in the 18 to 25 age group reporting signs of depression. As always, let's start with the day's market action. No Monday blues on the Lal Street as bulls maintaining their winning momentum. The Sensex and the Nifty hitting a record high in intraday trade. Bank stocks, though, relatively underperformed after a strong start. And the mid-cap index, while it closed flat, it did touch another record high. This for the 11th straight day, hitting a fresh record high. All in all, the market cap of shares listed on the BSC now crossing 400 lakh crore rupees for the first time ever. Prashant is standing by to take us through the market action. Prashant, a great start to the week for our markets. New records. It was an out-and-out large-cap day today with the Nifty making, of course, a new high. Actually, it was not as the Nifty. Bank Nifty made a new high. The mid-cap index made a new high as well. Uh, but, I mean, it was Nifty. And ex-banks, actually, did bulk of the heavy, heavy lifting. So, on your screen, what happened to the index? 150-odd points higher. Nifty Bank... I mean, middle of the range, it gave up gains from the highest level. Mid-cap index was up, small caps were absolutely flat. But mid and small caps, mid-cap specifically, had a big, game, had a big week uh, the last one. Now, uh, autos uh, participated and were the best performing index. So on the Nifty, you had Aisha, Maruti and Mahindra and Mahindra, which were the top three gainers. There were names like JSW Steel, NTPC Reliance, Old Economy, right, uh, which also uh, did uh, quite well. On the downside, Nestle was down, Apollo Hospitals pulled back a little bit, and Adani Ports, there, was a, there were huge volumes and was down from the word go in the morning. Now, in the broader market, more down than up. But I have to say this, what was up still uh, had much more volume uh, as compared to what was down, even though the list on the way down was longer. I'll start with what was down, Bandhan, of course, a big cut, REC business update, markets started, you know, taking some profits there, G shipping, there was Keynes, Newland, uh, and there was Venus Vibes, which came up about 4.5-5 watt percent as well. These were the big volume-led drags today. On the way up, as I said, uh, overall, the list was shorter, but longer list with volume. So, Exide, uh, huge gain on the tie-up with uh, Hyundai and Kia. Voltas doing very well. 
Gas Authority up 5%, Cochin Shipyard, there was Nokri which participated, uh, Nika doing very well, IIFL 13% on Friday, 5% today, Sundaram Finance, Loris Laboratories, KEI, NRB Bearings, Everity Industries, Godridge Industries, uh, Premier Explosive, Sadbhav, and I can go on with a few more. All in all, a very good session is what you had. A good session indeed. Uh, Prashant, many thanks for joining us. That was the market action. Crude oil prices, meanwhile, easing in trade after Israel announced the withdrawal of troops from southern Gaza and began fresh talks of a potential ceasefire. Brent crude has slipped nearly a percent, but it still remains above the $90 per barrel mark. Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia has hiked prices for all crude grades to Asia for the month of May after tightening supply. The big corporate stories this evening. Shares of Wipro wobbled today after the surprise resignation of CEO Thierry Delaporte. Srinivas Palia, who's been with Wipro for over three decades, will take over as the new CEO. Rima is standing by now with more on the winds of change at Wipro. The latest in a long line of CEOs that Wipro has seen in the last few years. Uh, Rima, this time an insider, but also bolstering rumors that... Uh, uh, it started around the start of the year about all not being well between the founders and Thierry Delaporte. Thanks so much for that. Well, it comes in as a bit of a surprise. Wipro has announced the resignation of the CEO, Thierry Delaporte, with effect from 6th of April 2024. He will be replaced by Wipro veteran and insider Srinivas Palya as the new CEO and managing director, effective immediately. That said, Thierry will stay on till the 31st of May to ensure a smooth transition but he does step down before his five-year term comes to an end in July 2025. Now, who is the new CEO, Srinivas Palya? He is a Wipro veteran and an insider. He's been with the company since 1992, which means more than three decades. And in his tenure, he's held many leadership positions, including the president of Wipro's consumer business unit, global head of business application services. And most recently, he's been the CEO of the America's One region, which is Wipro's largest geographic unit, contributing 31% to its revenues. Now, what's the street view on this? Well, for a change, Wipro has opted for an internal candidate. Remember, the previous two CEOs, Abid Ali Nemuchwala and Thierry Delaporte, were both external hires. Uh, Abid Ali Nemuchwala came from TCS. So, Srinivas Palya, being an insider, it gives him a head start compared to what any other external candidate would have had. And therefore, in that sense, it's a bit of a positive. But the company has had its fair share of CEO churn and the company struggled under the various CEOs. And therefore, the street is going to be watching out for the turnaround strategy. Is there going to be a change in this strategy? For instance, will they continue to focus on consulting, which theory did? So that's going to be an important watch point. But the assumption is that the recovery is going to be gradual. That said, any new CEO, whether it's internal or an external, his job on hand will remain the same. One is revive growth. Now, Wipro's growth rate has faltered compared to that of the industry, not just in FI23, but even in the preceding years under the different CEOs. In fact, in FI24, in the first three quarters, the company has reported a negative revenue growth. So reviving growth, getting back to industry growth rate, the revival of Capco, which has been hit on account of the macro pressures, the discretionary spending coming down, is going to be very crucial and also stemming attrition. The company has seen a slew, a spate of high-level, senior-level exits. This list is not exhaustive, but you know, the recent two, the most high-profile ones were the CFO chief growth officer, all stepping down in the last six months. Now, all eyes are going to be on the new CEO as he takes charge. In fact, CNBC TV18 has accessed an email written by him, Srinivas Palya, to his employees, and this is what he had to say. Our core purpose remains supporting our client's success. I will be a relentless advocate, urging us to focus on execution, embrace bold ideas, and take calculated risks to propel us forward. Together, let's craft the next chapter in Wipro's story, building upon the strong foundation led by those who came before us and shaping the future of technology and business for generations to come. Rima, many thanks. Srinivas Palia there taking charge as the CEO of Wipro. In fact, in January this year, when I spoke with Wipro Chairman Rishad Premji in Davos on the sidelines of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting, uh, Premji had very categorically said that Wipro's team was aligned with the vision of its promoters and that there was no misalignment between the management and the founders. Take a look. 
How confident do you feel about the ability of this leadership team yeah. to deliver the goods today? No, I feel supremely confident, Shireen. I think we're doing the right things. We're on a journey of change. We have a strong, stable leadership team and in an organization of, that is transforming and doing different things. You're always going to have some people that come in and out. And so that doesn't surprise me. That doesn't uh, uh, destabilize us. And we're incredibly excited and incredibly strong with uh, the team we have and the team we believe in very, very clearly. An alignment between the execution strategy of the management as well as the vision of the promoters? Absolutely. There's full alignment between the journey we're on and the journey we're going on. And so the report uh, don't believe otherwise. The report suggesting that there is misalignment? I, I, all I can tell you, Shireen, is that uh, our CEO and our team has our full support. Well, that was Vishad Premji in January saying that there was no misalignment between the vision of the promoters and the execution strategy of the CEO, Thierry Delaport. Well, Delaport out, Palia in. Bandhan Bank's founder, CEO, Chandrasekhar Ghosh, has said that he would step down as the managing director and CEO once he completes his tenure, which ends on the 9th of July. Now, the bank's shares were down 6% in trade today. In a conversation with CNBC TV 18's Ritu Singh, Ghosh said his decision was completely voluntary and personal. Ritu's here with more on the impact of Ghosh's exit on Bandhan Bank. Uh, what next as far as the bank is concerned and who potentially could take over from Ghosh uh, Ritu, uh, many challenges that Bandhan Bank faces. After serving Bandhan Bank for almost a decade, Chandrasekhar Ghosh has decided to step down as the MBN CEO of the bank once his term ends in July. The move has come as a surprise because the board of Bandhan Bank had approved his reappointment for another three years just a few months back in November. While the extension was yet to be approved by the Reserve Bank of India, the retirement announcement is being seen as negative by the street. Why? Well, for starters, the bank has gone through a churn at the senior management level. We recently saw its retail banking head, its CFO exiting, and at least four to five external executives who are new to the bank joining in just the last year or so. So the timing of the resignation has raised concerns that it could add to the flux at the senior management level and in the process significantly alter business growth and profitability of the bank. Now, Bandhan Bank's asset quality remains a concern. Gross NP is at more than 7%. And Realized slippage ratio above 4% or more for at least the last three years at a time when the rest of the industry has been able to achieve a turn around. The bank is also in the middle of a forensic audit commissioned by the National Credit Guarantee Trustee for a significant portion of its portfolio under the government's credit guarantee scheme. So the street worries the exit may not bode well for the bank at this point. For now, the focus is going to be on a smooth succession process. As for Chandrasekhar Ghosh, he is going to move on to a larger strategic role at Bandhan holding company level. I spoke to him earlier in the day to ask about the timing and the reason for this retirement and he said it has been in his mind for the last two years and it was purely a personal and voluntary move. Take a look. I only taken couple of people who are senior level, who are in the captain level. Of so it is there the ground will be very strong. These people are working with me the long time. And the mid level, there is in people we are developed them in the last more than one year, one to three years. And the top level we have been taken now. I have also get the time in the next three months. I will be like to make it and then to, to develop further if something need on that. Uh, Bandhan is my baby. I cannot give the risk to Bandhan. I will be like to decide how my baby will be like to save. And accordingly, I'll be like to exit. If you see that this is my totally voluntarily personal decision. Well, CS Coach stepping away from Bandhan Bank and speaking of leadership changes, Baidu's owned Akash Educational Services has appointed Deepak Mehrotra as its managing director and CEO. And this comes seven months after the CEO and CFO of Akash stepped down. Mehrotra was the managing director of Ashirvad Pipes before his appointment. He's also worked in Party Airtel and Coca-Cola. Ever since Baidu's acquired Akash in 2021, the embattled EdTech startup has said it's been using profits from Akash to hedge losses against its unsuccessful bets. Now on to a CNBC TV 18 exclusive. GST authorities have claimed that the alleged tax evasion in FI24 nearly doubled to over 2 lakh crore rupees. Sources tell us that the online gaming and casino industry, which is fighting the tax authorities in court, account for over 40% of the alleged evaded amount. Timzi is standing by now with the details. Timzi, uh, take us through this uh, 
escalation as far as GST tax related evasion is concerned? Well, that's right. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that the DGGI, that is the premier agency to detect GST evasion, has detected about 6,074 cases involving over 2 lakh crore rupees of GST evasion in FY24, which is a 99% increase as compared to FY23, where 4,872 cases involving a duty evasion of over 1 lakh crore rupees was detected. On the terms of voluntary payments, in FY24, 26,598 crore rupees was a voluntary payment made by taxpayers as compared to 20,713 crore rupees in FY23, which is a 28.4% increase. DGGI has also arrested 147 masterminds in FY24 as compared to 92 in FY23. And when it comes to the sectoral analysis, Online gaming and casino industry awaited the maximum GST, which was about 83,588 crore rupees, followed by coinsurance and reinsurance sector, where evasion of 16,305 crore rupees was detected, followed by secondment, that is import of manpower services, where evasion of 1,064 crore rupees was detected. Some of the other sectors where investigations with high evasion revealed that the other sectors are banking, financial services, insurance, pharmaceuticals, e-commerce operators. So let's see what is the future course of action for DGGI in FY25. Back to you. Timzi, many thanks. Car sales in FY24 hitting a record high of nearly 4 lakh units. The share of SUVs now almost 50% of the passenger vehicles sold in India. All of this as per data from the Federation of Automobile Dealers. Overall, retail sales have grown over 2% in the month of March. Two-wheeler sales up 5%, three-wheelers up 17%. Commercial vehicles continue to be a laggard contracting by 6%. Adani Total Energies has signed an MOU with MG Motor India to strengthen EV charging infrastructure. The collaboration will develop charging solutions for electric vehicles and value-added services for MG's EV customers. As for the deal, Adani Total Energy will install 60 kilowatt DC chargers at upcoming MG dealerships. Staying with electric mobility, Aether Energy has launched its new family scooter, which will be priced around 1 lakh rupees. The company's CEO Tarun Mehta told CNBC TV18 they cannot afford to go aggressive with pricing due to the cut in subsidies for electric vehicles by the government. The downward pressure that it creates is every time there's a subsidy cut, you sign up for more losses on your journey. And when you have more losses, to balance it better, you, have, you can't get very aggressive with pricing. I think that's what keeps happening. Right. We were able to absorb a lot of the subsidy pullback last year, but there's not enough margin left to absorb more now. So we still did. I think we have absorbed roughly half of it, uh, but we passed on roughly, like on blended basis, I think we passed on half of the subsidy cut to the consumer. So prices have gone up by 5,000 5, rupees. Well, that's Tarun Mehta of Aether Energy. On to a CNBC TV18 exclusive. The union government is considering a policy mandate to procure domestically made semiconductor chips. However, sources tell us there will be no restrictions on import of chips to meet domestic demand. Ashmit is standing by with more details. Ashmit, uh, so uh, a move to try and provide some support to domestic manufacturing of semiconductor chips. But uh, we're talking about manufacturing starting only at the end of this year uh, or sometime next year. Well, the government is clearly pulling out all stops for realizing the aspirations of Made in India chips. It already has a $10 billion corpus in place for supporting companies that are setting up shop here. Now it is looking to add a cherry on the cake. What is this cherry on the cake? Uh, we understand from highly placed sources within the government that the uh, METI, that the government is actively considering uh, a policy mandate in support of locally made chips. This mandate uh, will encourage local companies, local OEMs to incorporate, to procure, to use these locally made chips as a part of their products. That that's number one. The second is the government is also actively mulling the idea, the concept of using incentive as a policy lever for incentivizing the use of these locally made chips. Uh, this is something to bear in mind. Number three, uh, this policy mandate at no point should be construed as a restriction on import of semiconductor chips. That's an important word of caution and a caveat that highly placed sources have added to us. And finally, saying the government hopes that this policy mandate, the support mechanism, uh, will ensure that uh, there is augmentation of capacity. Capacities are built up uh, to cater for exports as well. 
Ashwit, many thanks. And staying with chips, the world's largest chip maker, Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, is set to receive over $6.6 billion in grants and $5 billion in a loan from the U.S. government. The funding under the U.S. Chips Act will bolster TCMC's bid to make advanced products in its Arizona facility from 2028. Moreover, TCMC has also agreed to increase its total investment outlay in the U.S. from $40 billion to $65 billion. Taiwanese firm Pegatron in advance talks to hand over the control of its only iPhone manufacturing facility in India to the Tata Group, this as per Reuters report. Now, the Tata has planned to hold a minimum 65% stake in the joint venture that would oversee the Pegatron plant in Tamil Nadu. The remaining stake would be retained by Pegatron with the firm providing technical assistance. In international news, U.S. Secretary of State Janet Yellen delivered a sharp message to China. On a state visit in Beijing, Yellen said future discussions between both nations will focus on Beijing's need to shift its policy on industry and the economy. Yellen discussed market-based reforms, addressed concerns over overcapacity in her talks with Chinese authorities and business leaders. I am particularly worried about how China's enduring macroeconomic imbalances, namely its weak household consumption and business overinvestment, aggravated by large-scale government support in specific industrial sectors, will lead to significant risk to workers and businesses in the United States and the rest of the world. Janet Yellen. More international news. Israel has pulled out most of its troops from southern Gaza, but the country's defense minister says the withdrawal is aimed at preparing for future operations. Conflicting reports emerged from the ceasefire talks underway in Cairo. Hamas officials deny claims of progress in talks, saying Israel continues to reject their demands. A blame game has erupted between Russia and Ukraine after one of the six reactors at Europe's largest nuclear power plant was attacked. The International Atomic Energy Agency has condemned the attacks, warning of a major nuclear accident. Ukraine alleges Russian troops attacked the reactor. Russia has denied the charge and blames Ukraine instead. U.S. President Joe Biden has outlined a new plan to provide student debt relief to more than 30 million Americans. The new plan is aimed to supplant an earlier version that was struck down by the U.S. Supreme Court. Biden is hoping to woo voters in swing states. A recent Wall Street Journal poll had put Trump in the lead across six of the seven swing states in the elections scheduled later this year. A Supreme Court judge in Brazil has opened an inquiry into billionaire Elon Musk. The probe concerns possible obstruction of justice by Musk after he said he would defy a court order to block or suspend some popular accounts on social media platform X. Responding to the court, a defiant Musk wrote on the platform, and I quote, this judge has applied massive fines threatened to arrest our employees and cut off access to us in Brazil. As a result, we will probably lose all revenue in Brazil and have to shut down our office there. But principles matter more than profit. End of quote. Up next on India Business Hour, non-communicable diseases are rising in India and cancer is the chief concern, says Apollo's Health of the Nation report. More details in just a bit. You can catch all of CNBC TV 18's news and updates on Facebook, X Threads, Instagram, and Geo Cinema. The increasing legal wranglings between opposition state governments and the central government over several crucial issues has the Supreme Court worried. Today, while hearing a petition filed by the Congress led Karnataka government, the Supreme Court observed, and I quote, there should not be a contest between states and the centre. The apex court stopped short of issuing a notice to the centre and has asked both sides to resolve the issue amicably. Now, this is not the only instance of a state government at loggerheads with the centre. The DMK-led Tamil Nadu government has also moved the Supreme Court, seeking disaster relief. In another case, the Tamil Nadu government moved the court against the state's governor, who administered the oath of office to a minister only after a sharp rebuke by the Supreme Court itself. Separately, the CPM-led Kerala government has also moved the Supreme Court over its borrowing limits. That case has now been referred to a constitutional bench. Here are reactions to the ongoing proceedings in the Supreme Court. Conduct of the state government on the question of fiscal prudence uh, is a consideration which the centre will take into account. If the implicit suggestion is that, is that the uh, centre is deliberately withholding funds merely because the states who are uh, making these uh, demands are opposition rule states, then I think that, you know, unless there is strong evidence to suggest that, that, is, that the center has no case and these must be released forthwith, and the center is either dragging its feet deliberately or turning its face to these demands for reasons of political expediency, right? Uh, the, you know, that, I, I, it, it's something that 
I find extremely difficult to believe. The center often plays uh, favorites or uh, delays payments. And it is here that some kind of mechanism has to be evolved. After all, the center in a quasi-federal structure is the pivot around everything that uh, works. I am afraid that I do not share his optimism about the center being fair always. It's not a South Indian issue. It's actually an opposition issue. You will remember that the state of Punjab almost had a constitutional crisis because the governor refused to call the session of the assembly to pass the budget. I feel in a lighter way, now every governor is competing that the more obnoxious I will behave with the elected government, maybe I will have a good political future ahead, uh, ahead of me. Well, we will have to keep watching this space closely. In a significant Supreme Court ruling, Articles 14 and 21, which guarantee equality before the law and right to life, will now accommodate right against the adverse effects of climate change. This as per the details of a March 21st judgment on a petition to protect the great Indian bustard, a critically endangered bird found only in Rajasthan and Gujarat, linking the right against climate change to the two crucial fundamental rights. Chief Justice Chandrachur has said they cannot be fully realized without a clean, stable environment. A significant development there that's largely been unnoticed. The Delhi High Court is set to rule on the bail plea of Delhi Chief Minister Arvind Kejriwal tomorrow. Kejriwal was arrested by the Enforcement Directorate on the 21st of March over the liquor policy case. He has been remanded to judicial custody in Tihar Jail. The Supreme Court has dismissed Aam Aadmi Party leader Sanjay Singh's plea challenging the summons issued against him in a defamation case. Singh, along with Delhi Chief Minister Kejriwal, faces Criminal contempt proceedings filed by the Gujarat University alleging sarcastic and derogatory comments over Prime Minister Narendra Modi's educational qualifications. No relief for BRS leader K. Kavita in the Delhi liquor policy case. A Delhi court refused to grant her interim bail, saying she's actively involved in alleged money laundering offence and destruction of evidence and attempts to influence witnesses. The court also said she would not be given a concession under a beneficial provision of the PMLA by virtue of her being a woman. Kavita, the daughter of former Telangana CM K. Chandrasekhar Rao, has been in judicial custody since the 26th of March. Prime Minister Modi addressed a public rally in Chhattisgarh's Bastar where he attacked the Congress. The Prime Minister also kicked off the BJP's campaign in Maharashtra with the rally in Chandrapur. He's scheduled to hold at least 10 rallies in the state. The Congress party has moved the Election Commission to act against the Prime Minister's remarks on its manifesto. The complaint claimed that the Prime Minister had violated the model code of conduct by spreading enmity between two religious groups. During an election rally in Rajasthan, the Prime Minister said the motive behind Congress manifesto resembles that of the Muslim League during pre-independence period. Former Union Minister Birendra Singh has quit the BJP and is set to rejoin the Congress party tomorrow. The move comes a month after his son, Rajendra Singh, joined the Congress. Birendra Singh had joined the BJP 10 years ago after a 10-year stint with the Congress party. Around 10 Trinamool Congress leaders, including Derek O'Brien, Shagurika Ghosh and Saket Gokhale, were detained for protesting outside the Election Commission of India's office in Delhi. The TMC leaders were staging a dharna outside the EC's office, demanding the removal of the current chiefs of central agencies, including the ED, CBI and NIA. Non-communicable diseases are rising in India and cancer is the chief concern, says the Apollo Health of the Nation report. The report draws inferences and insights from data based on people who have engaged through the Apollo hospital system and the medical ecosystem at large. The report also highlights that there has been a rise in mental health disorders. Ekta is standing by now with the key highlights from the report. Uh, a rise in cancer and other non-communicable diseases. Ekta, take us through what the report says. The burden of non-communicable diseases is rising in India and it seems as though cancer is leading. The number of cancer cases in India is expected to increase significantly, reaching approximately 15.7 lakh cases by 2025, up from 13.9 lakh cases in 2020. Breast, cervical and ovarian cancers are the most prevalent amongst women in that order while lung, mouth and prostate cancer are most common amongst men. Disturbingly, cancer diagnosis occurs at a younger age in India compared to other nations. For example, the median age for an Indian to get breast cancer is 52 years, while it is 63 in the US. And the median age for diagnosis of lung cancer is 59 in India, whereas it is 70 in the US and 75 in the UK. 
colon cancer, once associated predominantly with older individuals, is now increasingly affecting younger people with 30% of colon cancer cases at Apollo hospitals below the age of 50. One of the key reasons for drawbacks in India's fight against cancer is our poor screening rates, which is much lower compared to global standards, highlighting the urgent need for proactive measures in preventive health care. For example, in India, breast cancer screening is 1.9% versus 70% in China and 0.9% in India for cervical cancer versus 75% in China. Compounding these issues are disparities in healthcare guidelines such as the PSA threshold for prostate cancer screening which according to experts needs to be tailored specifically for the Indian demographic. Furthermore, the report underscores a rising mental health disorder with a sharp increase of mental health conditions of those between 18 to 40 years. Depression is emerging as a significant concern amongst the younger population with one in five people depressed within the age group of 18 to 25. Other key takeaways include chronic stress, especially seen amongst young adults and seniors, is adding to the increased incidences of hypertension and diabetes, with women being particularly vulnerable. Obesity, which is a risk for NCDs, has risen with majority living with unhealthy waist-to-hip ratios and belly fat. The report also indicates that high blood pressure and pre-diabetes are becoming increasingly common, particularly amongst the younger demographic. Today, 66 out of 100 people are pre-hypertensive and 1 in 3 people have pre-diabetes. However, amidst these concerning statistics, the report emphasizes the importance of early screening and proper monitoring. Early detection of conditions such as breast cancer significantly improves survival rates, while regular health monitoring leads to tangible improvements in blood glucose, blood pressure and body weight management. Ekta, many thanks for joining us and for highlighting uh, what the status of uh, health uh, as per the Apollo report is. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of India Business Hour. From all of us here, thanks very much for watching. Do stay tuned. The news continues right here on CNBC TV 18. We're back in a moment.